Good morning. Happy Monday if you're reading the chapters in the assigned order. You're reading, this is going to be the reading for chapter 8, which is what you're going to read on Monday, April the 5th, 2020. Nope. Monday, April the 6th, 2020. Sorry. Um, first of all, I don't know what's up with the glare. Like, I look like I'm in a filter right now, like a weird cartoony filter. My computer is just old. Um, I would not be doing a TikTok in this lighting. It's not good. Don't love it. But going to try to figure out uh, how to push through. Um, so, what we're going to do today is read Chapter 8. Remember, the last thing we see in Chapter 7 is going to be Jem being very emotionally affected by um, the situation with the Radleys. Now, we don't have a ton of information about why, but what we want to notice is that Jem, Jem is definitely starting to become more emotional and a little more withdrawn, especially after the pants incident. Remember, he gets the pants back, and um, they've been mended, but you can tell it's not by someone who's super good at sewing. Um, we are opening Chapter 8 with an, some unseasonal weather. Now, if the author is ever going to add anything regarding weather, like if, remember in, in Gothic literature, we had the metonymy of like the weather changing and often it's going to be uh, relevant to um, giving us an indication of, of a character's mood. Um, in the same way, you want to pay attention to weather in To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and I will kind of, we'll hopefully have a discussion at the end about the reason why, but anytime the weather is mentioned, and there are going to be a few times, just make note of it, and we'll make sure um, that we have a little chat about it at the end. Um, so if you're in this book, we're going to be on page 72, and let's get this party started. For reasons unfathomable to the most experienced prophets in Maycomb County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jem and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. So you want to think about all the times that your parents told you if you did this, then this would happen. Like my parents always told me if I bit my fingernails, I'd grow a hand in my stomach, which is extremely disturbing. Um, but yeah, this was one of those things that when kids were bad, they brought bad weather. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her, except when she watered her canas. Jem and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she had died of natural causes, to our disappointment. Ask him, Jem whispered. You ask him. You're the oldest. That's why you ought to ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Jem restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still touch us about a, touchy, irritated, about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jem had a notion that Atticus thought our activities late last that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jem and I had no basis for his idea. He said it was merely a twitch, meaning he thinks that Atticus probably knew they were doing more uh, that night that he lost his pants than he gave on, or he let on that night. Next morning I woke, looked out the window, and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom half-shaven. The world's ending, Atticus, please do something. I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said, it's snowing. Jem asked Atticus, would it keep up? Jem had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jem did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was Eula May, he said when he returned. And I quote, as it has not snowed in Maycomb County since 1885, there will be no school today. Eula May was Maycomb's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions with, when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us look at our plates instead of out our windows, Jem asked, how do you make a snowman? I haven't the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want y'all to be disappointed, but I doubt there'll be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnius 
came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran to the backyard, it was covered, covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jen. Look, every step he takes waste in it. I looked back at the mushy footprints. Jem said, if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jem, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. One snowflake. Let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. We can go over and walk at Miss Maudie's. Jem hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a black, or he had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed in Maycomb since Appomattox. It's bad children like you makes the seasons change. I wonder if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance and reflected that it, this was our reward. Remember his performance was him peeing off the porch and then being like, whoa. That's some crazy distance. And then they all tried it and Scout felt left out. They're feeling like maybe them spying on Mr. Avery's why this is all happening. There was something to say for sin. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery, Avery gathered his meteorological, me, whoa, meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jem Finch? You Jem Finch? Miss Maudie's calling you, Jem. Y'all stay in the middle of the porch. There's some thrift buried under the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. That's one of her plants. Yes, I'm called Jem. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? Beautiful, my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, it'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them in burlap bags. Jem asked her what she was doing that for. Keep them warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate like blood circulation. I cannot answer that question, Jem Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze, so you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, um, Miss Maudie? What, sir? Could me and Scout borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive, take it all. There's an old peach basket under the house. Haul it off in that, said Miss, Ma Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. Jem Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jem, and we transferred as much as we could from Miss Maudie's yard to ours, a slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jem? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get the basket and haul all the snow that you can rake up from the backyard to the front. Walk in your walk back in your tracks, though, he cautioned. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jem? No, a real snowman. Got to work hard, though. Jem ran to the backyard, produced the garden hoe, and began digging quickly behind the woodpile, placing any worms he found to one side. He went to the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. We had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jem said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess? I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jem scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound, which he added another load and another until he had constructed a torso. Jem, I ain't never heard of a black snowman, I said. Now note the, the language that's strong in this chapter. I'm going to read with a substitute, um, but we will discuss in a later um, installment of Couch Classroom the use of that word, especially in this chapter. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jem procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, like sticks, plated them and bent them into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Miss Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said. Fat in the middle and little bitty arms. I'll make them bigger. Jem sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He thought, looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jem glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery's short, sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jem scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jem succeeded in mis making Mr. Avery look cross, angry. A stick of stove wood completed the picture. Jem stepped back and viewed his creation. Sorry, phone call. Da -da 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 -da.
It's lovely. We're on 76, right? Sorry, that's so annoying. Um, but um, Stick a stove would have completed the picture. Jem ste stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jem, I said. Looks almost like he talked to you. It is, ain't it? He said shyly. We cannot wait for Atticus to come in for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard and the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jim, but from now on, I'll never worry about what will become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jem's ears reddened from Atticus's compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell where you're going to be. An engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You've perpetrated a near libel in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. In other words, he looks so much like Mr. Avery that it looks like they did it on, well, they did do it on purpose, but he looks so much like Mr. Avery. Remember, Mr. Avery's chubby and usually pretty angry looking, and Atticus is like, we need to disguise him a little better. Atticus suggested that Jem come, or that Jem hone down his creation front, creation's front a little, swap a broom for the stove wood, and put an apron on him. Jem explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do as long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors. Ain't a caricature, said Jem. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jem. He raced across the street, dis dis disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Maudie opened the front door and came out to the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly, she grinned. Jem Fitch, she called, you devil, bring me, that back, bring me back that hat, sir. Jem looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, erected an absolute morphodite in that yard, Atticus. You'll never raise him. Okay, so here's what's going on here, which I gave you this vocabulary on your um, lesson for the day, but they use the word morphodite a bunch in this chapter. Morphodite is going to be like a slang shortened word for hermaphrodite, which is an organism that has both male and female parts. The joke here is that it was first Mr. Avery, now it's turned into someone that looks more feminine because they don't want Mr. Avery to know. So um, it has like female and male um, attributes. The snow stopped in the afternoon, the temperature, dro temperature dropped, and by late, whoa. The snow stopped in the afternoon, the temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept fire every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it, asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and said she thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jem was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tussled. He was holding his overcoat close at the neck. The other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hun, said Atticus. Here are your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was finally wrong got through to me. What's the matter? By then, he did not have to tell me. Just as birds know where to go when it rains, I knew when there was trouble on our street. Soft, taffeta-like sounds and muffled, scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Maudie's, hun, said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the whole town siren wailed up the scale to a treble pitch and remained there screaming. It's gone, ain't it? moaned Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing? Oh, said Atticus, or said Jem. Atticus, reckon we ought to start moving the furniture out yet? Now the reason they move the furniture out of their house is in case the fire does catch from house to house, that if you take wood out, wooden furniture, it's going to burn more slowly. 
Not yet, son. Do as I tell you. Run down and take care of Scout. You hear? Don't let her out of your sight. With a push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching the street with men fill the street fill with men and cars while silently devout while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jem. We saw why. The old fire truck killed by the cold was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tinkling down the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jem. Jem put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll tell you when. The men of Maycomb in all degrees of dress and undress took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out of the window into the street and threw furniture until down furniture until the men shouted, Come down there from there, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jem. Oh, God. Mr. Avery wedged was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jem's arm and looked, didn't look again until Jem cried, He got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's Maudie shrubbery. Suddenly I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire, fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jim, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look! Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screamed around the curb and stopped in front of our house. That book, I said. What, said Jem? That Tom Swift book. It ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It ain't time to worry yet, said Jem. He pointed. Look yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. In other words, he seems to be standing very casually. Miss Maudie was beside him. See, he's not worried yet, said Jem. Why ain't he on top of the one of the houses? He's too old. Break his neck. Think we ought to go, ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's not pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jem. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. I just wanted to show you guys that maybe he's listening to. I'm sorry, but look at those precious eyes and look how one is definitely bigger than the other. She's the sweetest. Oh. Anyway, back to the top of 80. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heat between our house, Miss Rachel's and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts stuffed into their pants, but I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jem tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed. Fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and, ch and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave, first one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out the next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Jem and I slid across the street. Miss Maudie was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us that she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding onto our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Maudie would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate, he asked. I shuddered when Atticus started a fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity, then with sternness. Whoa, maybe he's trying to make us escape. I thought I told you and Jem to stay put, he said. 
Well, we did. We stayed. Then whose blanket is this? Is that blanket? Yes, ma'am, blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket I was wearing around my shoulder, squaw fashion. Atticus, I don't know, sir. Sir, I... I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood by the Raley gate, away from everybody. We didn't move an inch. Jem stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress, Atticus, I swear. That's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Maycomb was out tonight in one way or another. Jem, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry, I think. Go get it and we'll... Atticus, no, sir. Jem seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right and left in total disregard for my safety, if not his own, omitting nothing, not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put cement in that tree, Atticus, and he did it to stop us from finding things. He's crazy, I reckon, like they say. But Atticus, I swear to God, he ain't never harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jem said, for all Atticus said was, you're right. We better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Someday, maybe Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank you, I asked. Boo Radley, you were so busy looking at the fire, you didn't know who put, who, when he put the blanket around you. My stomach turned to water when I near, and I nearly threw up when Jem held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned around, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, do not let this inspire you to further glory, glory Jeremy. Jem scowled. I ain't going to do anything to him, but I watched the spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said. If you'd have just turned around, you'd have seen him. Seen him. Calpurnia woke us at noon. Atticus said, had said, we need to not go. Whoa. Atticus said, we need not go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try to clean up the front yard. Miss Maudie's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice like a fly in amber. We had to dig up under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in her backyard, gazing at the frozen charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Maudie, said Jem. We're awful sorry. Miss Maudie looked around and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. Always wanted a smaller house, Jem Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Maudie, I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child? Well, I hated that old cow barn. Thought of setting fire to it a hundred times, except they locked me up. But don't you worry about me, Jean Louise Finch. There are ways of doing things you don't know about yet. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple of rumors, and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those bell and grass will look plain puny when I get started. Jem and I looked at each other. How to catch, Miss Maudie? he asked. I don't know, Jim. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept the fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here you had an, some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you. And I'd had the sense to turn around, too. Miss Maudie puddle, puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard a shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in Jem and my affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said, One thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up. Mr. Avery will be in bed a week. He's right stoved up. He's too old to do things like that, and I told him so. Soon as I can get my hands clean, and when Miss Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lane cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years, and if she thinks I'm going to give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to her, Miss Stephanie couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it, among other things. The recipe called for one large cup of sugar, which is a pretty typical cake ingredient, so Scout's probably not on to, like, the big part of the secret. It was a still day. The air was so cold and clear we heard the courthouse clock clank, rattle, and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I'd never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. 
You've ruined him, said Jem. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when, it, when he added, Or scout me. We can help you. Miss Monty said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the morphodite, I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Motty stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly, she put her hands on her head and whooped. When she, we left her, she was still chuckling. Jem said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Motty. See you soon for Chapter 9.